Hi, and welcome to the Passionistas Project podcast. We're Amy and Nancy Harrington, and we'd like to start by thanking our newest patrons, Mark Wood, Beth Harrington, and Rob Johnson. If you enjoy listening to the Passionistas Project podcast, please consider becoming a patron. Just a small donation of a dollar a month can help us keep this project going. And you can get cool rewards like buttons, access to premium content, and invites to Passionistas Project events. Today, we're talking to Jess Phoenix. Jess is a volcanologist, geologist, and the executive director and co-founder of the nonprofit environmental organization, Blueprint Earth. As if that weren't enough, she's now a Democratic candidate for the U.S. House of Representatives in California's 25th Congressional District. So please welcome to the show, Jess Phoenix. We're so excited to have you here. Thank you for having me. What is the thing you're most passionate about? I love everything. I love learning about everything. And so I guess um, if I had to boil it down to one word, it would be curiosity. Uh, and I want to find whatever it is that sparks curiosity for people all around the world. Uh, and also for uh, individual people on a, on a basis of, do they like science? What kind of science? Do you like art? What kind of art? Are you into cars? What kind of cars? I just want to see people um, being curious about the world around them because that is actually how we accomplish great things is through asking questions and being curious. Tell us how that curiosity led you to found Blueprint Earth and what that organization does. Blueprint Earth is kind of the byproduct of working as a scientist uh, and seeing what happens uh, in science these days, which is sort of a, a tendency towards being very micro-focused. And uh, I was on a research vessel one time off the coast of Hawaii doing uh, research on an undersea volcano for a month, and everyone was tired. And we were, it was late at night because the submersible we were using would go down and be down for 24 hours at a time. So I was on the midnight shift and, uh, and I was sitting with a microbiologist and we were in, we're studying microbiology on this trip primarily. Geology was a, just a little offshoot. And uh, we saw fish swim by at 5,000 meters deep, which is over 16,000 feet below the surface of the ocean. And there aren't many big fish there. So I woke up and, and elbowed my colleague and said, what's that? Oh my God, what's that? And he just said, I don't do macro fauna. And I kind of went, okay. So his curiosity has been dulled because he's so fixated on one tiny detail. So what we do with Blueprint Earth is really encourage uh, students to learn how to do real scientific research. And these are college and university students. We have scientists in different fields. So geology, biology, hydrology, and atmosphere go and teach the students how to work together in an interdisciplinary way. So we have geologists who will help us with uh, cataloging small mammals or plants. And we have biologists to learn how to break rocks, to identify minerals. And uh, that sort of interchange of ideas is really valuable when you're trying to look at big picture issues like climate change. Talk about the path to being a geologist and a volcanologist to becoming a congressional candidate. Well, there is no direct path uh, leading from working scientists to Congress, you know, like it just doesn't happen. There's literally one scientist in Congress right now, uh, Bill Foster, who's a physicist from Illinois. Uh, there are no field scientists in Congress, so no people who do what I do. Uh, so it's very strange when you are in the sciences and you say, I'm going to run for Congress. For me, it really is, um, it, it's an extension of the kind of creative problem solving that you're trained to do as a scientist. Uh, I saw that Trump was elected and I thought, Mm, he's probably going to try to make good on a lot of his campaign promises. And I realized that our representative, Steve Knight, was voting 98.6% with Trump. And our district voted for Hillary by 7%. That's not what we voted for. And uh, it's really, um, it's upsetting to see that Steve Knight has a 0% lifetime voting record from the League of Conservation Voters. And that's not just, oh, he's not the best. That is, he is absolutely the worst on these issues. And I've dedicated my career to helping protect the planet and educate people about our possibilities here and how we live with the earth in a better balance. Uh, and that means, yeah, I know we have to extract resources, but you've got to then protect the environment. So these things, we have to do both. And we're not seeing that. We're seeing that drill baby drill mentality. And it is we can't just sit quietly by. And there's so many other areas that, that I care about. I mean, I married a Latino man whose parents were immigrants and we have cousins who are affected by what's going on with DACA. Uh, there are so many issues and you know, 
that are just fundamental to our country that as a scientist, I can contribute to. I can look at all the available data, help come to you know a plan of action that may be the best one. And then if there's new information, if we get new facts, I can change my mind. That's what we do as scientists. Do you also feel like being a woman makes it an important time for you to run? I do. I think getting diverse voices into Congress is a really important thing. And, you know, it's sad when we're still saying, oh, being a woman means you're more diverse. But when Congress only has 19 percent women representatives in it, that is a testament to how far we are from gender parity. And, you know, people like to make the argument, oh, just hire the best person for the job. Well, if you're not even considering people who are women or people of color, you're definitely excluding a lot of people who may be right for that job. So it's really important that uh, as a scientist, too, that I'm out there and, and I say, look, you can put your research career on hold because you have to go serve the country in the capacity of being a legislator. And that's something that a lot of scientists maybe weren't considering, but now they might. Talk a little bit about what issues are most important to you in this campaign. There's a few that kind of are really closely linked. So obviously the environment, of course I'm going to say that, I'm an environmental scientist. But if you don't have clean air, clean water, clean soil, uh, and the, you know, like a safe environment to live in, you are not going to be able to thrive and neither is your family. And we see that uh, families of color are far more likely to live in polluted areas than families who are white. So this is a problem that is affecting people really directly. And we need to work on environmental justice uh, in order to have the most productive society that we can. And that means people leading fulfilling lives and able to earn incomes that can support them. Uh, we also have to tie to that issues of health care. So for me, getting health care for everybody is fundamental. It's a right. And we need to make sure that we can guarantee people the right to have health care and to be treated and not have to go into debt and lose their jobs, et cetera, because they can't afford to make ends meet. Uh, they may lose their house. They may, it breaks up families. That's actually something that I've heard from people is the stress of the bills broke our family apart. And that's just not right. We are one of the richest nations in the world, but that, that wealth isn't being shared to improve everybody's quality of life. It, it just isn't reaching a lot of people. So one way that we can help level the playing field is by making sure everyone has access to healthcare. And then also tied to that is education. Uh, if we don't ensure that our public schools provide a debt-free, high-quality education to every American, we are doing a disservice uh, to our country because that's how we stay competitive. And also, I am so excited. I was listening to the radio just this morning. They were talking about DACA and recent rulings on that by district court judges. They were saying that um, they're going to reinstate uh, DACA applications, uh, hopefully. And that is great because a lot of students who are undocumented uh, through the DACA program can take advantage of getting a good education. So these, I mean, just educating the people who are here in our country is so important. And that means that we will have, if, if we do these things, if we have good public education, if we have good available health care that is not only affordable, but you know effective for people, and we make sure that our environment is protected, that's how we can have a population where people are able to, to work and grow and live. How have you educated yourself on all these topics? <laughs> Again, it's the love of learning. That's really been the saving grace for me. Um, I, I read all the time. Like when we're going in the car in between events, if I'm not driving, I'm reading news stories on my phone. I'm reading um, scientific reports on different issues like food security or, um, you know, uh, racial conflicts and policing. And, you know, I mean, like I'm trying to learn about all of this uh, because I think right now we've got a lot of people in Congress who are professional fundraisers and they're not curious about all these topics. Um, I am, and, and, and as a scientist, I'm kind of a professional learner. That's sort of what we do. So I wanna bring that, that skill with me. And I think it's so important that it's okay to say you don't know. Like when, when someone says, like I had somebody very early in my campaign at a local meeting say, what do you think about the FAA's rules for private pilots in small airspaces and planes under this? I'm like, I have no idea what I think about that. Let me do some research. Can you send me information about what you're worried about and what you know about the issue? And then 
I will investigate and take a look. And then I became a lot more knowledgeable about FAA private pilots issues, and especially those involving drones. And, you know, there's so much there. When you get to Congress, a lot of the time what people don't understand and why a lot of people, I think, will say, yeah, sure, add another lawyer, even though Congress is already 80% lawyers and business people. They say that because they think being a lawyer lets you know how to write legislation. It does not. It does not. Your legislation is typically written by your staff which is 20 year old people, 20, people in their 20s who are fresh out of school who want to work on Capitol Hill. So they do the research for you. And I think a big shift would be getting people into office who actually do want to know about all these topics themselves. Even the really, want, the, the really seemingly boring ones like budget issues or um, you know, specific disease research protocol or, you know, I, there's so much minutia. So you can't get down in everything but you can learn something and become more, more versed in it uh, for the short term. And then you'll at least have a basic understanding so that then you can say, let me ask experts. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Legislators are supposed to say, I don't know everything. Let me call up someone who does. But right now they're not. They're just legislating based off of corporate lobbyists and what they want. How do you get your word out to people? How do you, how do you run a campaign? Oh my gosh. I am not running a campaign in the way that... Uh, the people who know everything about campaigns will tell you to do it. Uh, you know, I'm used to blazing trails in my, my life as a geologist, and that's kind of what we're doing here because I initially got a lot of advice when I started running over a year ago um, that was very tailored towards a specific sort of candidate, the kind of candidate who is mostly just a figurehead, uh, who can sit in a room for 10 hours a day and dial for dollars. Uh, they will call the professional donor class of folks who are wealthy, who are already activated, who donate all the time, and they will just call them. Um, they get lists of them and you sit there and just dial and dial and dial. Uh, I rejected that, that way of doing things because I knew that I wasn't going to out fundraise uh, the people who are lawyers and business people who are in my race. And I'm certainly not going to out fundraise my Republican opponent, Steve Knight, uh, because he has the GOP dark money coming his way. So I thought, I can't beat them in dollars, but I can beat them in number of supporters. I can beat them in, in the passion for what we're doing here. And so that's what we've done. It's really grassroots. Um, I have gotten people involved who have never worked in politics um, on my staff and uh, as supporters and as volunteers. And there are amazing groups of people who are not even activated, like the scientific community wasn't engaged in politics prior to Trump's election. But I said, hey, you know what? Science is political. When a government decides that it's going to fund science or not, it's making a political statement. So the scientific method is apolitical, it's objective, but science itself, and if a government is funding all research and development for weapons, that's very different than funding the National Institutes of Health or the National Endowment for the Arts, or, you know, it, it just shows the priorities are different. So I want to make sure that we get scientists involved, that we get young people involved, and that's why we've been real grassroots. It's really like, small dollar donors, people who can only volunteer, they don't have any money that they can donate, people who are Spanish speakers who live in our community and can vote, but uh, no one has talked to them before, that's who I'm talking to, because I want everyone to be engaged. Do you have a typical day? Is every day different or do you have a routine? Every day is different, particularly because our district is really large. Uh, we have Simi Valley to the west, and then we extend all the way across to Lake Los Angeles on the east. This is a huge area. I mean, it is takes about mm, <clears throat> an hour and a half to two hours to go end to end, and that's if there's no traffic. So it's massive, and what we've tried to do is set it up so that each day of the week, Saturday through, you know, the next Saturday that we have um, set aside for a different part of the community. So we'll have a day where we're in the Antelope Valley, a day where we're in Santa Clarita, a day where we're in Simi Valley. And, you know, that's sort of how we do things is just move it around and then try to do events uh, and meetings with people, um, speaking at schools that are in those locations. And uh, I balance my days now. I do fundraising calls, but just a very, very small amount compared to what other folks are doing. But there's a lot of uh, meeting people. Uh, we do uh, meetings in restaurants where we have, you know, we just put the invitation out to the community. We talk to the restaurant owner and then people come and they have a meal with me and my staff and we talk. Um, we also do uh, in, in home like coffee parties uh, where people just come, they have a coffee and or a tea or whatever beverage they want. And 
we talk, they ask me issues, I listen to what their issues are. Um, and then we also do um, sort of like office hours in bookstores and, uh, and libraries. So those are really nice. And sometimes I get invited to really interesting things. I mean, I get invited to speak at, um, we don't have a major public four-year university in our, in our community. CSUN, California State University Northridge, is, is adjacent to our district. And a lot of people from here go to school there. So they asked me to come speak. And it was really neat because I was talking about the intersection of science and politics. So it, it could be something like that in a day, doing an interview um, or you know, going out and we do uh, district cleanup days too. We go out and we pick up trash from areas just around the community because you know, I think it, a lot of politics comes back to that community engagement level. And if people take pride in their community, it's going to reflect in everything that you do and all the results that you see in making, making it a better place. Is it hard as a newcomer to break into the group? And do you think being a woman impacts that at all? I'm really used to working in male-dominated fields. So for me, I don't often attribute things to being female uh, when I'm out doing my job, whatever that job might be. And then you do have people, people who mean well, and this is what drives me crazy, um, out of the three major Democrats running in my race, I'm the oldest and I have the most work experience and the widest variety of fields and the most in-depth experience. And yet I have people say, well, you know, you're so young, you're younger than them. And I'm like, no, I'm, I'm older than both of them. So I think people want to attribute that to the fact that I don't look like your standard issue politician. I'm not wearing pearls in a sweater vest. I'm, I don't have my hair, you know, in a, in a little bob. And, you know, I think that that is, it's just, um, I'm kind of at the front of a change in in what politicians look like, who they are, and you know, being out there, of course, it's going to mean that you go, oh yeah, this might be a little harder. But being from a background where it's mostly male dominated, I I just keep going. You know, you just say, okay, fine, I'll just work harder. And, and yeah, I think that is something that a lot of people have to do um, when they're not part of the in crowd. With everything that you're doing to keep this campaign moving forward. Do you ever feel unmotivated? I have to say that I never feel a lack of motivation. Sometimes I feel um, slightly overwhelmed by the negativity that goes on, um, not just directed at me, but when you see things, um, well, like yesterday or just recently, for example, um, we've I've been paying attention to Betsy DeVos and the education department, and you know she was um, stripping protections from different groups of people, disabled students, transgender students, sexual assault survivors, uh, and then most recently she's stopping civil rights investigations in schools. And when you see things like that, it feels like you're getting punched again and again and again because you're like, why is there no order to the universe? Where's the karma? Where's, where's the balance? And so then I have to remind myself, that's why I'm running. I'm running to be the balance because I want to put my finger on that scale because it's being stomped on on the other side and I want to go, no, no, no back to even. And I think that's, um, that's what motivates me a lot is when I see people who may not be able to speak up for themselves at that particular moment. And I say, well, I can, so I should. What's your secret for a rewarding life? A rewarding life is one that has time for appreciating um, everything around you and in whatever way you can. And so that means, again, it's learning, it's discovering, it's, it's, asking those questions and I mean I always say that I don't get bored and that's because I always have something else I want to know and so for me um, I don't know if I've ever been bored and even my parents would tell you as a kid you couldn't get me to stop reading and I'm still the same way like I want to be engaged I want to be I want to be taking information in and then helping other people be able to do the same thing so I think that's what it is you can you can consume, but you also have to create. And I think that when you find that balance is when you can be very rewarded and fulfilled. We're Amy and Nancy Harrington, and you're listening to the Passionistas Project podcast with our guest, Jess Phoenix. Jess is running for the U.S. House of Representatives in California's 25th Congressional District. To learn more about her campaign, visit jess2018.com. Is there a lesson that you've learned as a scientist that sticks with you in your life? Scientist lessons are, there are so many, uh, but I guess they boil down to look for solutions in unexpected places and use everybody on your team uh, to their full abilities. 
Because when you are on a, a field expedition in particular, um, like I've worked in, on six continents and some really remote places, and a lot of times in life or death situations, when you're working on active volcanoes, it is not um, a walk in the park. <laughs> it is quite far from that. And I've had everything from narco traffickers I've had to deal with to horse thieves um, to um, almost being sexually assaulted. I mean, I've had all sorts of things happen in the field. And then basic things, you know, like, oh, I got bitten by a weird bug in Australia. Uh, you know, what, what is this going to do? It's Australia. Everything wants to kill you. So, you know, it's like, I don't even know how to describe that bug. <laughs> so you have to kind of think of who can solve this problem for me? Is there anyone around to help? You know, okay, I've got them to help. What are their skill sets? And you just have to get very creative. I mean, a really classic example for me is I was on uh, the world's largest volcano, Mauna Loa, with a research group. And we had a rental Jeep that had bad tires and the sidewall of one of the tires blew out. So the air is rushing out and we quickly jammed a ballpoint pen into the hole. And, and we were like, okay, well, we stopped it. And then we said, what can we use to plug the hole? And we, we broke off a little piece of the black plastic housing of the Jeep, shoved it into the hole, covered it with bubble gum, and then put duct tape over it. And that's how we got off the site of the world's largest volcano in an area where there was no cell service. So there are, there's always a way out, but you have to be willing to just think outside of every box you've ever known to get there sometimes. So you're going to be like the MacGyver of Congress. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. I think, uh, I think I could bring a very valuable knowledge of how to solve really weird problems. <laughs> <laughs> and is there something you've learned on the campaign that sticks with you? I think the best thing that the campaign has taught me is um, I knew listening was important, but even more important, like just to put listening up even higher uh, because you can learn something from everyone. It doesn't matter who they are. It doesn't matter if they completely disagree with your point of view um, or your policies or your values. Just listen because you're going to learn something, whether it's a piece of actual knowledge, like a piece of data or whether it's a way of, of looking at the world, you're going to gain more information. So listening and being open to learning is probably the most valuable thing that I've gotten. What's the biggest professional challenge you've faced in your career and how have you overcome it? I actually was doing a PhD program in Australia and uh, you know I moved our whole family over there, uh, my husband and our cats and our dog, and uh, we used up all of our savings to get over there. And uh, I did the research. I went to Mexico, did the field work uh, on volcanoes there, and came back to Australia, was writing it out, you know, starting to write the, the dissertation. And my advisor and I just, we had some serious conflict. And um, some of it was stuff I was not comfortable with ethically. So I said, I can't continue. And leaving a PhD program is a big deal. Um, it was... I thought I would never work as a scientist again. I thought my dreams of working on volcanoes are gone. You know, I'm done. I'm, I'm worthless, blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera. Uh, cue the self-hatred, right? But, um, but then I realized, no, I still have a master's already in geology. Uh, and it's a good place to be an unemployed geologist, Australia. And so I was able to find work and work in a field I never would have considered, um, natural resources, because I'm a, like a total hippie environmentalist. But I learned about how natural resources operations work. And then that allowed me to understand not just academia, but industry. And then I ended up doing um, global business consulting work for an international corporation that helped companies be more environmentally compliant and economical. So I, I kind of said, oh, cool, I'm, I'm in this direction I never thought I would be in. So you have to do that. You have to take a massive challenge or that, you know, the closing of a big door. You got to find another door to open or a window to go through or something um, because it's your career isn't necessarily predefined and, and we can change these things. But you've got to be an active participant. You can't just, oh, woe is me. Um, and, uh, and then ask for help too. I mean, I asked everybody I knew. I asked my geology mentors and my colleagues, like, what do I do now? And uh, they let me know it wasn't the end of the world and that I was still a good scientist and uh, you know, that my ethics were worth, worth leaving the program for. So, you know, I, I'm still here. <laughs> you mentioned dreaming of working on volcanoes. Where did that dream come from? It wasn't a long held dream for me. I didn't even know I could be a geologist until I was almost done with college. Uh, and so I took a geology class and it was just introductory geology. And I just thought, this is great. It answers big picture questions. 
Um, but I didn't have enough time to change majors. So I took as many classes as I could and I just, I just loved everything about geology. And uh, it was when I decided to go, I used my history degree, which I ended up having from undergrad. I used that for a few years working for the state of Arizona uh, and their archives. And then I got tired of working indoors. And I said, well, maybe I can go back to school for geology. I found that Cal State, this Cal State University system has a program where you can make up um, credits that you've missed while you're in a graduate program. So I was able to take physics and you know, like the introductory courses like mineralogy that I hadn't had um, beforehand while I was in a graduate program. So I, I shifted gears and um, it was really, really interesting uh, because I applied, uh, I was in my second semester, I applied to um, a, a volunteer researcher position at the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory. I just found it online and I thought, well, volcanoes sound cool, I should check this out. And to my surprise, I got accepted to the program and that was um, the first day that we went out into the field. Like we were on Mauna Loa with scientists from the Cascades Volcano Observatory and the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory. We went to the summit of Mauna Loa in the caldera, which is not erupting right now. It's um, last erupted in the 80s. And we're standing here and I'm like, this was all active moving lava in, you know, it's younger than I am and I'm standing on it. Okay, volcanoes are amazing. And that was before I had even seen flowing lava or sampled it or, you know, gotten really close to an active eruption. And it's just, uh, it was really, um, like it hit me like a freight train, like this is my thing, this is what I love. And so, yeah, what can I say? Now I'm a volcano file. <laughs> Were you into science as a little girl? I was into science. I was into everything. But uh, my mom and dad were great in that they helped me with science projects. Um, the first uh, elementary school I went to, we moved a lot. My parents were FBI, so we moved a lot. Um, but uh, the first school I went to in Virginia, we had science fairs. And I remember my mom helped me do a project on backyard bugs and um, one on making a, um, making a moving picture. You know, when you draw out things like by hand and then you spin it on a turntable thing. And then we also did, um, we did one about plants and how they grow under incandescent versus fluorescent lights. And I thought they were awesome. And my dad got me a chemistry set, um, just a little kid one. And then uh, he, they also got me um, a model, an anatomical model, the visible woman. It has the skeleton and all the muscles and the organs and then the visible horse. So I got all of those. And I, if I wanted a book, my parents would get me a book on anything. So that's why I'm so fortunate, like, because I had parents who weren't scientists, but they were supportive of me being curious in that way. And they would help me with these projects. They'd help me design them. They'd help me do them. And, uh, and then when I went to a school, when we moved, we, we, our school didn't have science fairs. And I was like, there's no more science fair. So I grew up to do my own science fairs. <laughs> what did your mom do at the FBI? And was she a mentor for you? She was not intending to be a mentor for me. Uh, she just did her job. She was, so my mom, before she joined the Bureau, was a school teacher for nine years, public schools, um, middle school and high school. She was a Spanish teacher and she also taught French. So she was an expert in the Spanish language and the Bureau, when they opened things up to women, uh, my mom was like the 108th woman or something like that in the Bureau. And um, she was recruited for her language skills. So she went from being a school teacher, taking knives away from students in the classroom to a, pro a profession where she carried a gun. <laughs> so really big change. And she always, I think, saw it as just, well, I'm just here to do a job. Uh, and it's, it's funny because she met my dad at the training academy in Quantico. That's where my parents met. And um, it was really interesting. I, what I did see uh, from them that I've really carried with me is that they have a very functional, true partnership. When they were both working at FBI headquarters in DC, um, a position opened up in Colorado for a supervisor. My parents were tired of DC. Uh, but there was only one supervisor job and both my parents were supervisors at this point. So in order for my mom to be able to take this job, my dad had to step down and, and he actually did that. He stepped down so that we could move to Colorado and then he eventually became a supervisor again. But my mom did terrorism. My dad did uh, cybercrime and bank, uh, bank fraud. So, uh, but my mom being the terrorism expert always surprises people because they think the guy is going to be the terrorism expert. But no, if you've watched the news post 9-11, you've seen my mom because she's on there as a talking head and, you know, she is one of the world's experts on terror. So. What's her name? Suzanne Menser. And uh, she actually was, uh, she retired from the Bureau in 98 uh, and then 
the governor of Colorado needed help with after the Columbine shootings. Uh, and so my mom was appointed by him to be on the Columbine Review Commission. And then after that, he appointed her the head of public safety for the whole state of Colorado. And then uh, she left that when George W. Bush uh, uh, created DHS, Department of Homeland Security, after 9-11. And my mom worked under Tom Ridge uh, in Homeland Security, and she had a $4 billion budget that she supervised and uh, to coordinate state, local, and federal law enforcement responses to events. So yeah, I mean, that's, that's who I was raised by. So she wasn't intending on, like, let me mentor you, but I will tell you, when I get in a mood, I use my mom's, my mom's voice. Like, I sound exactly like my mother when she's like, preparedness is not something people want to invest in. You know, and when she, that's like how my mom sounds. So you know when you open your mouth and your mom comes out? That happens to me, but at least my mom is a really cool FBI agent. Well, former FBI agent. <laughs> Do you have other female role models through your life that have influenced you? It's funny because um, I was often in positions where my direct uh, boss or supervisor or person I was looking up to was a man because I've worked in science. Uh, but there are women who I knew of in science or who knew just a, I knew them a little bit. Um, it, it, when I got to the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory, I met a woman named Christina Helliker who was a volcanologist. Um, she was there for years. She was pretty much retired by the time I got there. Um, but she is, you see pictures of her out with the guys standing there near an eruption, you know, just doing her job. And I'm like, oh, I see myself there. And so, I mean, the absence of, of women, the absence oftentimes of people of color in science, that really kind of lit a fire under me to create the nonprofit that I created because we are, we do everything we do, all the student research opportunities are at no cost to the students. So because of that, we have 76% women participating, 54% are people of color, and 60% uh, come from low income backgrounds. Because I, and, and we have a program where we take those students and the scientists we work with into elementary school classrooms because you need to get them when they're young and you need to say, look, see, you can be a scientist. And that's, that goes through for every profession. If you can't see yourself represented, it makes it really hard to, you know, put your face in the end goal. So, I mean, for me, I, oftentimes it was the absence of women that spoke as loud as the women who were there. Did you have any cultural heroes growing up, women you saw in pop culture? <laughs> Well, you know, of course, um, Sally Ride was pretty neat uh, because she became part of pop culture. Her and Jane Goodall, Sylvia Earle, like these are some of the big names in uh, exploration and um, in, in science and discovery. And I thought they were pretty awesome. Uh, but I also, um, you know, what I really liked was I went to a lot of, I, I'm, I listen to punk music and there's oh, there are a lot of guys in punk. And what I would see is I'd go to concerts and even if the guys were the people on stage, there were women at the crowds and they were in there in the mosh pits or they were, you know, they were wearing the t-shirt, spiking their hair. And I'm like, oh, that can be a woman. That's a woman too. You know, that's, that's, that's acceptable as well. Okay. So, you know, every time you're just open to the world around you, you can see more, more options. And, and I think that it's kind of cool to see that the punk scene was accepting of, of female fans. And of course there are some great female punk artists too, but, uh, you know, it was, it was cool. It was just cool to see, um, to be born in the eighties and to see this, this sort of shift into, you know, it's post women's liberation movement. Um, you know, and we were, we were trying to define what, being female meant. Could you have it all, the career and the kids and everything else? And it's kind of some unnatural pressure too, but it means that now when I see, um, you know, women and men working on equal footings in different industries, or when I see young girls who are just like, yeah, I can do that job. It, it just makes me so happy. I mean, it makes me really grateful too for the people who went out and, and were the, you know, the vanguard of that movement because we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for them. And God, right now the Me Too movement, Keep it going. I mean, keep keep calling out the fact that we have silenced um, this this part of our culture for so long. Um, I, I've been in a room uh, with five other women, and every single person in the room had been raped. And I'm like, wow. I mean, that that is devastating. But that is that is reality. And you know, it's we're at a point in our society, I think, where women are coming into our own power even more. What's been the most rewarding part of your campaign? I think the most rewarding thing is really is learning so much and listening to people and, and meeting good people. I've had so much amazing interaction with people I never would have talked to uh, in my daily life. And 
to me that that's just super valuable because connecting with people uh, a true connection not just talking at them but hearing what they're saying that is something that we cannot overstate the importance of in our information age so you know everybody's divided by screens well let's connect in in real life is there something you know now that you wish you had known when you started Yes, and this is not a cheerful thing. I wish I had known exactly how much our system is pay to play. Um, people know that, like you kind of know people with money do better in political situations and pretty much every situation in our country, but it is, money has infected every aspect of politics. There's an industry, there's a whole political industry uh, full of consultants who want to sell you their services uh, and, it's, it's just growing out of control. Citizens United uh, really opened the floodgates, that, that Supreme Court decision just really opened the floodgates to big money, dark money in politics. And corporations are not people, but yet they are getting sway over our political process like individuals should have. And of course they carry more clout because they're so much bigger and, and wealthier. And if I had known exactly how bad the the infection was with money um, it just being so pervasive I don't think I would have run because it is an almost insurmountable obstacle and you know when they say they told me oh well you know you need to get 200 names of people to call uh, for your you know first day that you announce that you're running and you'll be able to raise a hundred thousand dollars from that and I'm like I don't think I can do that. But the consultants said, oh, of course, of course you can. You know, like that's what everyone does. Everyone is lawyers and business people, not scientists. And so I kind of said, I don't really know that my 200 names are going to do this. Um, and, and they just, they didn't listen to me. And I was sitting there going, well, if, if you say so. So there's, you know, I, I would pass on to anyone considering running, uh, build your network out beforehand so that the day you announce, particularly for a congressional race, you can get like $50,000 in the door your first day, you know, something to that effect. Um, and build the relationships with, you don't even know who's influencing these things. So there's a lot of deep background research that you need that I wasn't aware of uh, because I was a scientist uh, doing science work. So the, the process right now is really set up to exclude most people from the conversation. And it's um, shocking to, to when I learned that only 0.58% of American adults donate politically. So that is who determines who gets on the ballot. And if we want to push back on that, Right now, it, we can't because we have people in office who got there in the current system. And so those traditional corporate politicians on Democrat and Republican side of the aisle, they have no interest in changing the system. So we need people to back grassroots candidates uh, who will pass meaningful reform. And, and until we do that, I need people to donate, not just to me, but to other grassroots candidates, even if it's five bucks, because then you have a voice in who gets on the ballot. What is your proudest career achievement so far? I think creating Blueprint Earth and actually having um, students go through our, our program uh, and end up getting jobs and going to grad school. Uh, we've had students go uh, work with us and go on to PhD programs, um, work with us and get jobs in, in industry or jobs in academia, working in labs. Uh, we have one student who was on our first expedition uh, back in spring 2014, and uh, she was a nursing student at Cal State Los Angeles. And we came by her classroom, I talked about it, uh, and she came out to the desert. She was gonna just be a nursing student. She was like, that's what I thought I could do with a biology degree. Uh, she fell in love with the desert and became one of our repeat volunteer researchers. She kept coming back out, and now she has a job working as a wildlife biologist at the Grand Canyon. And, and it's amazing because she's a first generation college student. Um, you know, her family is Latino and, and she is just totally doing something no one in her immediate family had ever done before. And I think that that, that to me is really fulfilling because I'm like, hey, I helped her find something that she never would have had access to. What advice would you give to a young woman who wants to be a scientist? Keep asking questions and don't ever work for somebody who's afraid to say they don't know. So um, ask them the tough questions and when you stump them and they say, you know, I'm not sure, but let's find out, that's the person you want to work with. So, I mean, because that, that's just, that's just good life advice too. Uh, work with people who know the extent of what they know. And what advice would you give to someone who wanted to run for a political position? Do your research beforehand. Find a network of people who will support you both financially and with their, their passion and their volunteerism. Uh, and 
I think that you need to have somebody in your life who you can tell anything to, whether that's a spouse or, you know, somebody who's like your sister, your brother, your parents, find someone in your life who you can just offload with and who will be very, very generous with their uh, time uh, with you so that they they don't begrudge you when you're at the end of a long, hard day and you're worn down and you just say, I just, just let me tell you all the crappy things that happened today. Listen, you know, find someone who will listen to you and uh, we'll just be there because having that support system, if it's more than one person, fantastic, uh, but at least have one person. Don't go into this by yourself because you will never succeed in any major undertaking, but particularly politics, if it's just you. You need a good team. And that's both like paid staff, volunteers, and family and friends. What's your definition of success? Success for me is, it's a tricky thing. Um, because I think for me, it's sort of just when I have done something or achieved something or been part of something that I feel happy about, that I'm like, okay, or I can be proud of. Uh, so for me, it's really just um, whatever I do, I want to do it at a level where I'm proud of it. Like this campaign, for example, um, I have told my campaign supporters and um, I've told the other candidates in the race. I've told local people who are you know, influential in, in political circles. Yes, I'm not going to run a negative campaign. Like I will do my very best. Like I will stick to issues and facts. I will differentiate myself from the other Democrats and the Republican in the race by saying like, here's a problem. Like it's not you're a jerk. It's your policy is not good enough you know, and here's why. And, uh, and that's, I want to be proud of this. Like, I want to look back at my, my race in 10 years, whether I'm in Congress or whether I'm doing some other research, I want to say, yeah, you know, I, I can, I can look at this and go, mm -hmm. I think I made a positive impact. And to me, that's when you're successful is when you, you impact everybody around you in a positive way. Do you have a mantra that you live by? I do say a lot of times um, to students, I, I give them some advice when I work with the college and university students, uh, and that's anything worth doing is difficult. And it doesn't mean everything difficult is worth doing, so I caution them about that. Uh, but I do say that anything that I've seen in life that has been really worthwhile is it's not easy. You know, you have to struggle to get the outcome that you want. And so I tell them that like, even if it's really difficult, if your parents are splitting up or you're trying to go through school or you're working two jobs just to pay the bills, um, you know, if, if your sibling gets sick, I mean, I had one of our students, her sister got cancer and yet she was still trying to apply to medical school. You know, I mean, all these things happen and I'm like, just keep going, keep going. Because, you know, at the end of the day, what you want to get out of this you only are going to get it if you walk through hell to get there. So, and I think that you have to know when to ask for support too. And that's what I tell them as well. It's kind of the second part of that, which is say yes to everything. So when you're out there and you are putting yourself out there saying, I want to be a doctor or I want to be a pilot or I'm really interested in, in studying jellyfish, whatever it is, um, tell everybody you meet because you never know who's going to say, oh yeah, my cousin is the lead jellyfish researcher at Scripps Oceanography Institute. You should talk to her. A and there you have a connection. So that's what I tell people is it's in order to say yes, you have to tell people what you want and then they can offer it to you. So it's, it's the putting yourself out there. And then when someone does say, I've got a really cool opportunity, you know, or do you want to help with this? Just say yes, just do it. Don't, don't second guess yourself. Don't undermine yourself and just do whatever you can to make it possible for you to have the opportunities you wanted. Thanks for listening to the Passionistas Project podcast and our interview with congressional candidate Jess Phoenix. To learn more about her campaign, visit Jess2018.com. And be sure to subscribe to the Passionistas Project podcast so you don't miss any of our upcoming inspiring guests.